Hi, welcome back to the Veronian Treasury Treasure Vault. I'm Lee, and this is Little Bit. Little Bit's not talking today. I think she's got some sort of puppy laryngitis or something. I'm not sure what's up with her. So it's just going to be me talking today. Um, wanted to share a uh, interesting photograph I picked up over the Christmas holidays. Um, it's uh, from the Second Boer Wars era, um, and it has a photograph of the Indian Medical Service and um, Army Medical Service, which was a precursor to the Royal Army Medical Corps um, group of personnel at Netley, um, which is uh, the Netley College of Medicine, which was at um, the Royal Victoria Hospital in um, Netley, Britain. So uh, one reason why this photograph is important um, is because of the group um, that's here being uh, in an IMS, AMS photograph, you know, any military photograph, um, you know, is, is always important for historical records um, and for filling in, you know, historical blanks and memorializing the lost and forgotten, obviously. Um, but what makes this one particularly special is a couple of the men who are featured in this photograph and also who this group is, group is associated with, um, as well as the fact <coughs> that the family who this belonged to, the Liston family, took the time to write all the names of all the, the men that was on here. So we know who every single person here is, except for one, what their last name, <coughs> some of their first initials, and if they were with the AMS or IMS. We also know that this group um, was under uh, Sir Almroth Edward Wright, which was, he is a, a very important figure in um, past medicine, and even somewhat till today. Um, the two gentlemen in the photograph that are important to, to the group is um, uh, William Glenn Liston and Colonel Edmund Baron Hartley. Now, um, this photograph, I did a extensive amount of research on it and uh, got a lot of help from two great ladies, uh, one of them mentioned Julie Green and Brenda Finley. Julie Green is with the Netley Military Cemetery and uh, Brenda Finley is with Netley Abbey Matters, <coughs> two great organizations that I am going to put links to in, um, in the description, and I'll also talk a little more about at the end of the, the video here. Uh, as I mentioned, <coughs> this is a group of IMS, AMS, any medical service and Army Medical Service personnel. Um, this photograph takes place uh, right around the turn of the 20th century. Um, William Glenn Liston, who I mentioned here, uh, studied, he was born in 1872, died in 1950, and studied medicine at Glasgow University. And he entered the IMS, the Indian Medical Service, in 1898, uh, where he began working <coughs> at Sir Almroth uh, Wright here at Netley, where the photograph he was taken. Um, we know that he was there um, from... Um, 1898 to somewhere just after the turn of the century, um, but by 1903 he was in India um, as he was part of the Indian Medical Service and after arriving in India he immediately was assigned to the Indian uh, Plague Commission which is still around until today. Uh, they still have had problems with the bubonic plague up as early as 1994. They had a pretty big outbreak <coughs> in uh, southeast and southwest India if I remember correctly. Um, when he got there, uh, he began looking into um, anaphilius mosquito carriers of, um, of malaria, <coughs> and I wrote a paper on that. But while he was studying the transmission of malaria through mosquitoes, um, he became interested in transmission of the bubonic plague um, through rats. Because up until this point in time, we thought the bubonic plague was spread <coughs> uh, by rats from um, you know, town to town, person to person. Um, which made it very hard to eradicate, especially um, in <coughs> places like India, where there's a large, large life population of rats, and in some places in India, rats are actually revered. There's a couple of temples, one uh, really po uh, famous one, where the rats there are given presents and food. So they're thought to be the um, reincarnated um, ancestors of, of their loved ones and also of gods and goddesses, um, which, and that area made it even harder to eradicate these rats. Um, <clears throat> but one female rat can produce up to 250,000 babies in one year um, through their litters, their litters, litters, and so on and so forth. Um, so getting rid of all of them is very hard. 
uh, which is what we've been trying to do from the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, you know, straight up um, until this time period, was still trying to kill the rats and stop the spread of plague. Well, this is found, and it's important until today why a reason why we don't have as much of a problem with bubonic plague as we do. Um, we still have small pockets of a popping up around the world. Um, we still have a few cases in the United States, but nowhere near as the problem they were having at this time period. <laughs> um, it's because he found it wasn't the rats, it was the fleas. The fleas are the ones that were transmitting the plague, and if you kill the fleas, you essentially eradicate the plague. Well, fleas are actually a lot easier. They're smaller, but they're much easier to kill because you just put out a fog of, of um, poison. A pesticide. Um, one uh, <laughs> poison flea goes on and, and gives it to other, other fleas and kills them. Whereas with a rat, you put something like arsenic out, the rat eats it, only that one rat dies. And after a while, you know, the rats pick up that, well, my little buddy here ate that, that cheese, and he died, so maybe I shouldn't eat that. Rats are much smarter than we give them credit for. They're actually pretty smart. Um, so they're very hard to, to eradicate when that is what you need to do. Um, you know, thinking to do to get rid of a disease. Uh, in fact, during the Dark Ages and Middle Ages, <laughs> even through Victorian time, um, when there was plague outbreaks, uh, the local governments would pay people to bring for each one of the dead uh, rats they brought. Well, because of this, people started breeding rats. They would have more rats to bring, dead rats to bring to them, which spread the disease even more. <laughs> uh, because you have more rats, you got more fleas. So. Listen was very important um, to the medical community and to the uh, stopping the spread of plagues and even other diseases because of his work there in India at the uh, turn of the century. Um, he was actually honored 21 years after his death in 1971 um, by Carl F. Meyer um, at the uh, American Veterinarian Society for his work um, <coughs> on the eradication of the bonnet plague through the study of rats and the uh, being fleas that were spreading it, not the rats. So, even though he'd been dead for a couple of decades and has been for much longer now, he, he's still very well revered. As I mentioned earlier, he studied under Sir Almroth Edward Wright, um, who was born 10 August 1861, passed away in uh, 30 April 1947. Um, Sir Almer Thevel Wright, uh, still to this day, as we speak right now, um, his contribution to medicine is still being studied. <clears throat> and it's still very important to uh, current day, even what, what we're going through right now. Um, he was a British uh, bacteriologist and immunologist. Uh, he graduated from Trin Trinity College. Um, his, he, his, one of his first notable developments was developing a system of anti-typhoid fever inocula inoculation. Uh, while he was at St. Mary's Medical School in London. But what we still see from uh, study him today and still are uh, talking about him today was he recognized early on that antibiotics uh, could create um, resistant bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria, like MRSA. We created MRSA, uh, which is a antibiotic resistant Staphylococcus. Um, so be because we, were gave, we treated people with so many antibiotics when they didn't need it. We give antibiotics for viral infections and antibiotics when we treat bacterial infections, not viral infections. So it, it creates um, the potential for resistant strains of bacteria. So 70 years, 70 plus years after his death, we are still looking at his research <coughs> and um, what his fear of creating these resistant strains of bacteria have now come true. So we're looking at the steps, the preventive steps that he thought we should take and should have taken um, still to this day. Another thing that he's well known for and uh, through the military, um, in World War I, he lobbied to have 10 million vials of vaccines created <coughs> to uh, inoculate soldiers. This was in response to how many soldiers died in the Second Boer War, which was from this time period here. Um, and those soldiers didn't die from battlefield wounds, they died from preventable diseases and probably would have made it through the war if they had been inoculated. So because him pushing to have that done in World War I, the rest of the uh, you know, Allied forces in World War II, um, you know, and even us in World War I and the other uh, countries allied with uh, Britain began to inoculate his soldiers and we still today, us and, and many other military uh, outfits around the world inoculate soldiers because of the work 
that uh, Sir Wright um, started. Uh, for all his great uh, contributions to medicine, <laughs> he was definitely a known misogynist. Um, kind of a little side note on that. He wrote a book in 1913, The uh Case Against Women's Suffrage. Um, not definitely, that was not the the best look for him. Um, definitely misguided. Uh, he thought that women's brains were um, underdeveloped compared to men's and couldn't handle uh, important social and public issues. <laughs> and a number of the uh, important women suffragette figures like uh, Rebecca West, Mary Sinclair, the writer Charlotte Perkins Gilman, um, they wrote articles and uh, Gilman even wrote a, uh, a novel satire called Herland that was basically in specific opposition to his book um, and said he was better suited to sticking to his theories in medicine. <laughs> so um, on another side note about him, he was also a friend of George Bernard Shaw, uh, fellow Irishman, um, and was immortalized in his play, The Doctor's Dilemma, as Sir Colenso uh, Rigian, and was also portrayed in a number of his other plays and playlets. So um, Sir Wright was also a uh, literary figure as well. Um, even though they were friends, Shaw and Wright were on complete opposite sides when it came to the women's suffrage movement, and Shaw saw his views as ridiculous and absurd. <laughs> the last figure that um, is important in, in this photograph is a gentleman known as Colonel Edmund Baron Hartley. Um, he was part of the Cape, Mount, uh, Cape Mounted Riflemen. He was a surgeon major and then later on a surgeon colonel. Um, he was part of the Cape Colonial Forces. Um, at 32 years of age and uh, 5 June 1879 in the Basuto Gun War, he was in South Africa. He was awarded the Victorian Cross, which would be the um, English equivalent to um, the Medal of Honor, um, for his uh, his um, his bravery during the um, unsuccessful attack of Morosi Mountain. During the attack from an exposed position, he uh, carried in his arms a wounded corporal to safety, and then went back out exposing himself under heavy gunfire to uh, apply bandages and address the wounds of the, um, the attacking party, uh, the unsuccessful attacking party as well. Um, so he's very well revered, very, very highly revered by uh, military uh, personnel in Britain, uh, even around the world. And in 1955, his Victoria Cross was actually sold for a record amount at the time of 300 pounds of Sotheby's. Um, which blew out of the water any previous records, specifically because of how well respected he was. Um, <clears throat> I was able to date this photograph because of Hartley being in it. If Hartley hadn't been in this, I would have had a much harder time dating it. I would have been down to a few years, even though Liston's in it, which gets me down to a few years. But I know this was taken somewhere between August of 1899 and March of 1900 <laughs> because, um, and uh, the end of the summer, which would be August, is when Hartley came to Netley. And in March of 1900, he was in Alawal, uh, South Africa for the Second Boer War and was promoted to Surgeon Colonel at that time. So, probably had been there for a little while before that as well, but uh, that's the first specific mention of him um, being in South Africa was in March. And so. Puts this time period down to about six months, which is really important to know that because now, as <coughs> um, Julie and Brendan and myself continue researching the other men in here, since we only have their last names, some first initials, you got a name like Jones. Well, there may be 50 Jones that were in Netley, but there may only been one that was there during that six months. And so now we can put that picture to that biography we had, which is <coughs> immensely important for later on for other unnamed photographs to find more and more about that person. Um, that's why it's really important to save and protect photos, especially ones like this, and even the photographs you have today. Um, you know, photos that <coughs> were taken down in the digital age, people put them onto USB sticks and SD cards. Like I have an SD card and the camera here. But keeping them on those is going to cause a problem 10, 15 years down the road because those have a little tiny charge, static charger in it that only lasts 10 to 15 years. So 
if you don't back those photographs up <coughs> onto a magnetic drive, um, like the hard drive you have inside a laptop or computer, um, not a solid state drive, an actual magnetic drive, 10, 15 years from now, you'll stick that USB drive or that SD card into your computer and you won't have any pictures left. So I highly recommend putting them onto a magnetic drive. And I also recommend printing them out because you know you have 500,000 photographs on a magnetic drive. That's one item now that, that if that one item goes bad or goes missing, you've lost all, all half a million photographs. But if you print out the important ones, then you've got multiple items <laughs> that will take to have to be lost and take to be destroyed. So um, it's nice to have the hard copy of that for a multitude of reasons. Um, and please do what, what the person listen family did and, and write information on the back of, of your photographs, um, you know, photographs that you purchase or have any collection that you find more information about. Uh, find a way to attach information, you know, the info to it. If you want to write on the back of it, catalog it, put a number and have a catalog book with it. I, that's what I do. <laughs> um, and be sure to to take photos like this and share them with the groups that um, will most appreciate and can use that information and fill those gaps in, the historical blanks um, <coughs> about the time period, the groups, and the people, um, like Netley Abbey Matters and uh, Netley um, Military Cemetery. You know, if you're a seller, sure, go ahead and watermark it. I understand that if you want to do that. But, um, you know, let's say you put a, a photo in Cowan's Auctions. And many times when I'm going to buy a photograph or somebody else does, they go and they check to make sure that what that person saying that photo is really is that. And they'll contact one of these historical groups. Well, if you've given that photo that, to that historical group and they helped you research it, when they contact them, they're going to immediately say, oh, I know that photograph. We've actually had a copy in our records of it and, you know, digital copy. And yeah, we're the ones that helped identify that, which is going to add credence to the photograph and to you as a seller. Um, because now it shows you care about, you know, finding out and researching the items. Um, and as a collector, it's very important to do that because it helps um, create a larger network of information. So um, I wanted to really quick um, put a screen capture of Julie Green's uh, group, Netley Military Cemetery. This is their website. And Brenda, fin Brenda Finley's uh, Netley Abbey Matters. This is her website. And this is her Facebook page. I highly recommend checking them out um, if you want to learn more about Netley, Netley Abbey, um, the Indian Medical Service, um, Army Medical Service, RMAC, um, about World Victoria Hospital, um, you know, or about any more <coughs> of these men here and the other men and women, the nurses who were involved with these groups. I highly recommend going and checking them out. Um, or if you have information uh, that pertains to Netley Abbey, um, to the different uh, armed medical service, the Army Medical Services, any medical services, um, or about Royal Victoria Hospital, which is now left derelict. It's uh, which is unfortunate, like a, a lot of you know old hospitals and uh, buildings are. Um, they would love to have the information in those photographs. It, the more they get the more of uh, the uh, broad spectrum picture that they can, they can build for, you know, um, historical uh, um, importance for later on. So please check them out. Uh, their links are in the description. Um, if you like learning about uh, antiques or, you know, historical pieces, or just uh, want to watch a amusing talking dog, um, give me a hard time. Please subscribe to our channel and click the like button. Make sure to hit that bell for notifications to let you know when we've got new videos coming up, which I try to add at least two new videos a week. Um, check out our Instagram page and our Twitter. Uh, we'll be fleshing those out as well as our Facebook page. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Catch you guys next time. Thank you.